Welcome back, everyone. Uh, uh, this is the last event uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, gathering and celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy Fellowships. Um, uh, we are very grateful to Ambassador Peter Vitish uh, that he agreed to address um, um, our event. Um, uh, it is very important for uh, for rather obvious reason. Uh, Despite that many hundreds of people contributed to the program for many, many years, it was the German government and the foreign office uh, which set it up. And I think this reflected and reflects uh, the belief in uh, patience and far-sighted policies. Bridges, as we say, are not built overnight. And I think that bridge between German and American academia has been built for 50 years. And today, it is a very solid bridge. Uh, but we know that uh, sometimes it takes much longer to repair the bridge than to build it. You know, when you walk to business school from Kennedy Street, you will have uh, the best example of, uh, uh, of that. Um, so I think uh, we are very fortunate to have that program. Uh, we are very fortunate that that program has been so successful uh, and strong. Um, and we are looking forward to seeing you at another celebration. Uh, well, we'll do it 25 years from now. <laughs> um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, 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 His Excellency Peter Wittisch. Uh, he has been serving as uh, German ambassador to the United States since April 2004. Uh, before that, uh, 14, oh sorry, 14. Uh, before that, uh, he was the ambassador to the United Nations uh, in New York when uh, Germany was the member of the Security Council. That was 2011 and 2012. Uh, he has a broad experience of serving uh, uh, in Europe, but also in Middle East. He was the ambassador to Lebanon and Cyprus, um, was German government special envoy on the Cyprus question. And before uh, starting his uh, career in the foreign service, uh, 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 Mr. Whitting studied history, political science, and law uh, at the universities at Bonn, Freiburg, Canterbury, and Oxford. He was also assistant professor uh, uh, at the University of uh, Freiburg. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Center for European Studies. Thank you, Professor Eckert, for that kind introduction. It's a wonderful pleasure and an honor, indeed, uh, to be here in this August uh, university in this building with apparently a strong uh, German heritage and um, um, surrounded by you and um, just have learned that 75% uh, 70, of the audience here is German. And I didn't expect to have an intra-German uh, conversation here, but I'm looking forward to hopefully a spirited um, discussion. I always feel reinvigorated when I'm in, in a university. Uh, the first three years of my professional life I spent as a young uh, assistant professor at the University of Freiburg. I have fond memories. I never had a more leisurely life uh, than at that time. I know that's not uh, your case, uh, but I was just a small fish. Um, and, and so whenever I, I'm at a university, I feel um, great and reinvigorated, fond, fond memories. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, what in the world is really more thrilling, uh, more exciting, sometimes more uh, scary than uh, foreign policy in general and transatlantic uh, relations in particular? It has prompted, this world situation has prompted even very sober politicians and foreign policy analysts recently to wax poetic. A world in turmoil, that's uh, how our former foreign minister, Frank Walter Steinmeier, called it. A world in disarray, uh, as my friend Richard Haas uh, phrased it in a book, or maybe one of the most gloomiest uh, formulation I encountered was at the Munich Security Conference, a Hobbesian state of nature. 
That's uh, what somebody called the situation, the international situation. Um, so our world order, I think we all um, agree, is under uh, stress. Uh, and this trend is also reflected in the transatlantic relations, both uh, this year and uh, last year have seen uh, a strong return of uh, populism, nationalism on both sides of the Atlantic. We saw it in a very hostile um, campaign uh, landscape in, in Europe, uh, partly in France, in other European countries as well. With Brexit, uh, we have seen a successful campaign which was largely driven by nationalist-inspired uh, fears. And in the US, uh, we uh, observed uh, similar dynamics. Uh, Donald Trump's uh, presidential campaign centered on the slogan, from this moment on, it's going to be America first. And as he said it in his unforgettable inauguration speech that I had the um, honor to um, witness in person a couple of steps away, every decision, whether on trade uh, or tax issues, whether on immigration or on foreign policy, should in future be contingent on whether it benefits America. That was the tonality of that inauguration. So this uh, pre presidency, for us in particular, uh, really does mark a departure from many familiar principles of traditional American foreign policy. Although it's um, not really um, easy to predict where this White House is headed, what the power uh, configuration will be in the White House and in this administration, uh, will, will the internationalists, the so-called internationalists prevail or the more nationalist uh, school of thought or will the president um, be uh, shifting between uh, the two camps in a, in a more or less erratic way? We, we don't know. But one thing is clear, there is a lot of change ahead and uh, we will have some challenging uh, transatlantic years ahead of us. What does this mean for transatlantic relations for us uh, Germans uh, and uh, Europeans? Um, in this administration, um, I think this is uh, one conclusion that can we safely draw. In this administration, the president's domestic priorities will dominate US foreign policy and much more than uh, it was the case with his uh, predecessors. The effect so far, however, I would describe as twofold. We see a lot of continuity when it comes to security policy, as well as a lot of disruption when it comes to trade and economic policy. Despite often confusing and contradictory rhetoric, there has been, in this administration, it took a while, a clear commitment to NATO as the backbone of transatlantic security. There is agreement that the alliance plays a key role in providing security to Eastern Europe. There's also recognition that we need to counter Russia, Russian efforts through engagement but also with a determination about protecting our allies and through resolute preparedness. And there's also an understanding that we can only combat international terrorism together. Only together can we fight ISIL and ISIL-inspired um, terrorist attacks that threaten our common way of life in the US and in Europe. And in the Middle East, in Syria, Iraq, and beyond in Afghanistan, we continue to cooperate closely in our fight against terrorism, as well as in our stabilization efforts. Germany stands shoulder to shoulder with the US here in that broad anti-ISIL coalition. We um, are contributing substantially to those efforts. National Security Advisor um, McMaster and Gary Cohn, uh, they have published uh, a rather um, uh, interesting uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago. Um, they described a little bit the international arena with uh, some thoughts that were, again, uh, reminding us a little bit of this Hobbesian world where 
all uh, countries are um, fighting for their own advantage and uh, with uh, you know sometimes uh, different alliances. But in that same article, the two authors also made it clear, America first doesn't mean America alone. In fact, the United States has reaffirmed its existing alliances and coalitions in Europe uh, and in uh, Latin America and in Asia. And at the same time, it has become very clear that these words seldom came from the president itself, himself, but rather from his uh, national security people, General Mattis, McMaster, uh, General Kelly, uh, Secretary Tillerson. Um, we have seen um, also um, not much inclination towards institutions, international institutions or alliances. The president is more of a transactional person that has the uh, immediate results um, uh, firmly in his view. He's less a person, it seems to me, that thinks in institutions and alliances. And uh, the president, to our dismay, has also decided to opt out of one of those international frameworks, uh, the global agreement that uh, included the entire international community, namely the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Uh, many people in Europe took this badly and feared uh, that this would be a sign of abdication of the US international leadership role or um, of uh, the leadership in the Western Alliance. There's also um, a strong skepticism in the administration, and here I'm breaking this down a little bit to uh, one conflict that's very much on our mind, uh, skepticism towards the Iranian nuclear agreement, uh, the JCPOA, an agreement which is a multilateral agreement negotiated by a rather unlikely coalition of the US, China, Russia, and the three European countries, uh, the UK, France, and Germany. Uh, it's an agreement that we hailed as a major uh, step forward in enhancement of security, not only regionally, but also globally, with a strict, almost unprecedented monitoring and inspection regime. And uh, we have now um, certain indications that there is a conversation in this administration whether um, it, this administration should stick to that agreement. <coughs> I think we'll um, be submitted to a kind of litmus test in mid-October when the president has, according to the timelines of Congress, to certify whether Iran um, is complying with its obligations, yes or no. The more obvious disruption, um, though in a, another field, is an area where it's more crucial than in any other to the Trump administration because the voters will judge its success by it, and that is in the economic and trade policies. Um, I'm not speaking here about uh, the economic policy domestically. You, you've been following that all, the certain deregulations that the president uh, could uh, initiate on its own, where he needs the Congress. It's a more difficult assignment and uh, things have stalled and are stalling in, in tax reform and in infrastructure expansion. The administration has become resolved, however, in defending American businesses against perceived unfair foreign competition in its effort to create a so-called level playing field. And trade is, as we see it, misjudged as a zero-sum game, meaning one country's gain is another country's loss. And it, that seems to be uh, the president's thinking. Countries with trade surpluses have wound up in the crosshairs, and that includes not only China and Japan, Mexico and South Korea, but also, in particular, uh, my country, uh, uh, Germany. But one look at the foreign investment uh, side of economic relations uh, in the US, the FDI, the Foreign Direct Investment, reveals that this is, in our view, 
an incomplete uh, criticism. Nearly every European company also produces uh, in the US, often in an economically challenged uh, region. More than 3,000 uh, German companies uh, have created, through their investment here, more than 700,000 usually well-paying jobs to Americans. And our economies have become so closely interwoven that our countries mutually benefit as we see it. On the flip side, they would both likewise severely suffer from any disengagement. Now, how does this new American skepticism towards free trade manifest itself? And mind you, I'm not saying that this is a, a, a Trump uh, thing, but as we know, it is sort of a kind of a paradigm shift in this country uh, coming from the right and from the left. One important example, of course, at, at the beginning, uh, that didn't affect us so much, uh, was the executive order that the president in his first days signed, namely to uh, cancel, to reneging, rescinding, uh, American signature under the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That was a sign that he means business on free trade agreements. In my humble view, uh, a uh, you know geostrategic decision of the first order and history will tell whether this uh, is to the benefit of the United States or not. Another example is the World Trade uh, Organization. This organization that was founded upon strong American initiative is um, really called into question by parts of this administration because it is regarded to run counter to US interests with its trade decisions. Also, uh, we all know this administration has called for the renegotiation of NAFTA. Uh, it is happening with a very ambitious timeline. Um, this is a kind of litmus test, as I see it, how this administration will proceed uh, in trade relations. It's something that German industry is watching uh, with an acute uh, interest because it really impacts on the integrated supply lines that many German businesses have, Mexico, US, um, Canada. And now we don't know uh, where the US will be coming out. Uh, will the course be a I think very meaningful modernization of that agreement. Uh, will the US demand a sort of fundamental new agreement or will it make good on some of the threats of the president, namely um, to withdraw from that agreement? Uh, that remains to be seen. And again, this will be a kind of litmus test how this administration will be going forward on trade. Tariffs on imports um, uh, could be um, uh, could be imposed um, under the guise of uh, being a national security threat if um, the administration uh, to go forward uh, with invoking national security when it comes to steel and aluminium exports to the U.S. That again would be a paradigm shift. Uh, no country uh, in recent past has ever imposed uh, import tariffs on goods uh, that were not um, directly related to national security. And the long planned border adjustment tax, this was again one great concern emanating from Congress. In our view, luckily, seems to be off the table. So I just enumerated some of the dossiers in that trade issue. And again here, uh, German interests are uh, nowhere more affected immediately as in that uh, trade and um, economic uh, field. Um, but the notion of using um, those tools to make imports more expensive and domestic products cheaper is very alive and well, as I said, in this country. Um, and because um, it could trigger uh, counter reactions, in the worst case, it could start a trade war 
uh, between uh, the European Union in this case and the US, it is dangerous. And that would be the two main trading blocks in the world that share a lot of values, would uh, go after each other in trade. That's the worst case scenario, I admit, but that's something we really want to avoid. What do all these changes mean for Europe, uh, for the transatlantic partners? First and foremost, these global and American developments have been, maybe that's a positive effect, that's uh, you know, a beneficial effect, have been a wake-up call for Europe and the European Union uh, in particular. Um, we all remember, uh, because it made a big splash here in the, in the US, uh, the declaration of Chancellor Merkel. I think uh, she made it in June after the G7 meeting in Sicily and a meeting of uh, uh, NATO leaders in Brussels. She said, we can't, uh, to a certain extent, not fully rely anymore on our allies. We have to take our fate in our own hands of course, uh, always in great friendship uh, with the United States, uh, but it means uh, we have to be more responsible for, for our own future. And I think that, that was a reflection of uh, what we had seen in the weeks and months uh, before. Um, in Germany, um, the European Union, and I don't have to tell that to you is much more than a single market. Uh, for us, it's a peace project. It brought peace, uh, prosperity, stability to the European continent as never before. And sometimes I have in, in Washington, um, especially at the beginning of this administration, uh, I felt I had a hard time to uh, convey that we're not just an economic club with ups and downs, but that we fundamentally a political project to safeguard peace and uh, prosperity on our continent. And that first and foremost, the European Union is our political home and it's a, if you will, successful peace project. It was challenged by Brexit uh, that, that was uh, probably the most serious challenge uh, that we had to weather uh, since the inception of the European Community. And that sent shock waves, shock, shock waves uh, not only through the EU but beyond. Strong skepticism against the EU um, is more widespread among the people uh, of Europe than before. Uh, and there's no denying the European Union is not in the strongest shape. Although, uh, and I always have to tell that to my American interlocutor, uh, who's growing more, is that the European Union or the American, or, or, or the USA, and most Americans believe that it's by far the US and that Europe is continually in a deep recession. Uh, the truth is the European Union, not only Germany, but the whole European Union is growing more then has a higher growth rate than the US. But it's clear um, we have um, problems in Europe and we have uh, to tackle the uh, problems of Europe and uh, take action where action is urgently needed. And that includes the areas of uh, migration, of asylum policy, um, of external borders, of internal and external security. We have to... Um, develop more synergies and more cohesion in European defense um, and of course also in uh, the economic and social uh, field. Now with the election of the French president uh, Macron, uh, I think we have um, really a window of opportunity uh, to push uh, Europe forward, to reform Europe and here, uh, although it's not universally a popular idea, um, it's incumbent about, uh, on that leadership tandem, the uh, French and the German government, uh, to take uh, the vanguard uh, role. And um, we have to make uh, Europe more competitive. Uh, we have to 
uh, assure a better coherence between monetary and uh, economic policy. And as I said before, we have to work on a better common uh, European defense. Um, I had the pleasure uh, last weekend uh, when I participated in a meeting of German and French CEOs uh, at Evian, a yearly event. I, I had to report uh, on the situation in the US. President Macron was there, uh, the finance and economics minister Bruno Le Maire was there, and they exuded uh, this sense of uh, uh, reform of of uh, new beginning of enthusiasm not only uh, for um, the domestic uh, po political scene in France but also on the European scale and uh, it was contagious a little bit and you could feel there is a will uh, to take Europe forward um, in close consultation and a as a team uh, with with Germany. Um, Chancellor Merkel has said, and I think Macron thinks the same way, um, we are 27 countries with 28, but in future uh, 27 in the European Union, with all the differences and uh, different levels of development, also different aspirations in terms of integration. And we have um, to work towards a more flexible and if, uh, if need be, uh, a multi-speed Europe. Uh, if we want to advance, we cannot wait for the slowest, but we have uh, to create uh, a, a multi-speed uh, Europe. A Europe where some countries move forward together if they want, uh, and uh, others um, can um, move uh, a little slower, uh, but eventually join. Now, with regard to Brexit, we have to make sure that we have uh, continued a close cooperation and economic integration with the UK, whatever um, the final deal will be. Uh, we certainly, as Germans, have no interest in um, uh, loosening uh, the relations uh, to the UK beyond what is necessary in the framework of uh, the Brexit, uh, quite the contrary, we have all the interests to keep uh, the UK as much as we can in the fold, but it's also clear that um, there can be no concessions on our four freedoms uh, in the single market, uh, no cherry picking. And uh, I think it's clear, Barnier made this clear, uh, we have some tough negotiations ahead of us. And Brexit, Brexit I think that's the Bottom line here is a lose-lose game, but it is has been the decision of the um, British population, 52% uh, of the British population. It's a lose-lose game, but my take is the UK will lose more than we will. Um, with this new challenge for the transatlantic relations, um, some people in Europe uh, are thinking already about uh, an alternative to the transatlantic alliance. Some see a rapprochement with an increasingly authoritarian and aggressive Russia as an option. Others see China as a possible ally um, for international rule of law and free trade. I think that comes mostly from the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, who seems who has presented that vision as China is the standard bearer of uh, climate uh, protection and uh, international free trade. These discussions, if they are uh, meant to be serious, I think are not realistic and uh, I think not even desirable. There is no, that's my conviction, I think shared by the bulk of um, officials and the political class in Germany and the population, there is no alternative to the transatlantic alliance. It goes to the core of our Western um, way of life in many areas. The U.S. remains uh, simply indispensable. We need it as a guarantor for security and stability, as the central player and the keeper of our rules-based international order, as well as a flag bearer of open markets. For these reasons, we must invest 
not only to continue to invest, but we must even invest more in the transatlantic relationship precisely now. That's why uh, we've been reaching out in DC uh, since November with renewed energy and effort to this new administration, to the constructive partners, also to the more critical elements in this administration, to members of Congress, to the federal states, to the governors who are sometimes our best allies, to the thriving business community, to uh, the civil society. And one thing became clear, and so a little bit to my surprise, even in this phase of transatlantic relations, the interest in dialogue with Europe remains great and even in, in some cases has, has grown. But I will also say America is bigger than the president. Uh, on issues that are important to us, climate change and uh, cooperation in workforce development, the, this famous uh, model of dual vocational training in free trade and other issues. We're working with a whole array of different stakeholders and uh, across the USA. So I think what the perspective should be is view this country as an enormous varied landscape that is sometimes very fragmented where we can form coalitions with like-minded partners and stakeholders and sometimes uh, avoid the exclusive focus on Washington and on the presidencies. But we will continue to point out the risks that the America First approach holds for international policy and stability on both sides of the Atlantic. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm closing. Um, there is a compelling reason why Germany and the United States have been such close allies. Over time, our societies, that's maybe even more important than the good relations between the governments, our societies are closely connected. Uh, our peoples link through various personal relationships. Uh, this broad common basis is something unique, uh, but it's not a given. It needs to be cultivated, filled with life continuously. John F. Kennedy was, um, of course, a great statesman. Uh, an outstanding American president, deeply ingrained in the collective memory of uh, Germany, but he was also a strong advocate of the role of the community uh, for private engagement uh, and for the power of people to make their countries uh, a better place. He understood how important these bonds are for international alliances, how personal friendships and exchange are often as important, if not more important, than treaties and diplomatic relations. And few academic exchange programs reflect this ideal more vividly than the John F. Kennedy Memorial Fellowship. Since its inception, it has brought scores of German researchers to the US and deepened our economic, not economic, academic exchange and cooperation, even at a time when universities uh, in both countries were still very inward looking. So it has led to manifold joint research process uh, projects, and it has for the last 50 years, something to be proud of, built personal ties, friendships, and new bridges between our countries. It has become a cornerstone of uh, the transatlantic friendship, and this is something that will, also for the upcoming 50 years, I'm sure, never go out of fashion. Thank you for your attention, and if you like, um, I would enjoy a conversation with you. Thank you.